Hi, I'm Christina. Welcome to the Revolver Fan First podcast, where we go deep with artists on their history as a fan. Today, we have Michael Paulson of Volbeat, which is an exciting development. How are you? Fine, thank you. Excellent. So the first question we ask everyone is, who was the first artist you put on a pedestal? I put on what? Like a pedestal? I kind of looked oh, up. Put on a... uh, without any doubt, Elvis Presley. Yeah. Yeah. What struck you about him? What was so special? It was just, you know, um, in my home, when I was uh, a little child, that was always music. My parents was constantly listening to the 50s music. And at the same time, my father bought the first video machine. Um, I was the only one in, in the, the whole school that, ha that had that video machine. So people kind of knew me for, oh, that's the guy who has a video machine. And I was not spoiled. And I, I come from a very laid back, you know, humble family that didn't have much money, but some, somehow my, my father found a way to, to get to that machine. But um, <clears throat> uh, my whole point with that machine is that he was recording a lot of uh, music programs on a lot of German television because the German television um, had a lot of different uh, music, uh, music programs. So he was recording everything. So I was used to just watching a lot of performers and <clears throat> there was this um, music entertainment program called, uh, I think it was called Let's Rock. And at that time, uh, Shake and Steam was quite of a household name in that program. So I became a huge Shake and Steamers fan and basically just watching a lot of uh, performers um, coming from everywhere in the world and um, very, quickly uh, I think it was my father said you know that English guy Shakespeare Stevens he's totally copying Elvis Presley so my father he said you have to look at the real deal even though I, I, I love Shakespeare Stevens my father also really did like Shakespeare Stevens but so he put on a lot of Elvis videos and at the same it, it didn't took me more than a few minutes just to sit because not only was it amazing music that I was used to hearing uh, in my home, you know, because that was the music that my parents were playing. But the, the electrifying show with Elvis Presley, with the whole personality, his look, the way that he was speaking, the way he was addressing the audience and just, you know, uh, everything around him seems so unnatural because he, he looked like something from another planet. It was like, he looks like a superhero, uh, a singing superhero. And I thought, wow, who uh, uh, is that Elvis Presley? And I was just spellbound. So I could sit, I could sit on, on, on the floor watching Elvis Presley for hours, you know, if, um, if there was a lot of noise in the house, you know, I, ha I have a twin sister and I have two big sisters who are also twins. So a lot of kids in, in the house chasing each other around like, like Tom and Jerry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, they could just put on an Elvis Presley video and I'll be going. <laughs> and, and then they actually caught me. I was um, sitting on the floor with the black pin tried to dye my hair black because I wanted to look like Elvis. Uh, so I definitely put him up on, on a shelf where it was like, yeah. oh, wow, you know. He's like, he's got such a physical relationship with the music as well, like even beyond that, like it almost kind of comes through him. Like it's, it's kind of, it's, he, he left his mark and I'm glad he left his mark on you because um, you've gone forth and made a lot of great music. So it's a, this Thank is you. a positive yeah. development. Um, well, what did he, your dad, yeah, no, you go. No, no, you know, he definitely had a lot of impact in how I uh, later on um, created Volpe, you know, the way I was writing music, the way I was trying to get my vocal across, you know, I was definitely very much inspired by Elvis, still is. Yeah. Uh, something to do with his rhythmic and, so yeah, you know, a lot of the stuff that I was listening to as a child, I brought that into Volbeat. Um, so I'm very thankful for all the music that my parents has been playing uh, in the house back in the days. What was the, what did your dad kind of teach you? What was the most important lesson your dad taught you about rock and roll? 
like what to what was what was, was most... like he was, he was not really teaching me anything about rock and roll but he was teaching me you know how to grow up and how to be a good boy and a later on a good man but he didn't he didn't he was not striving for perfection because he was not perfect as a as a kid as a kid either so uh, you know i was allowed to do a lot of stuff i had a lot of freedom but he you know he was tough when he was supposed to be tough um he was a good man uh, i don't have him around anymore um he died uh, i think it was 13 years ago oh. um but when it comes to music he had a huge vinyl uh collection with all this uh, 50s music. So there was a lot of Elvis Presley, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Jerry Lewis, Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, and also a lot of artists who was kind of standing in the shadows of these legendary performers. And they became just such a huge part of the uh, the music in the house when, yeah. when you, you were home. So when I moved out of the house, something was really missing. So I and, and I, I, I kind of knew that was the music. So I uh, started to collect all those vinyls myself and bought everything I could possibly get on, on vinyl and later CDs. Do you teach your child that you play a lot of music to your child? Uh, the thing is, uh, <laughs> I kind of have enough of music in my head <laughs> so it's, like, I, it's your I, life I, yeah. I, yeah so when i'm home i'm not really listening to music yeah there, there was a time when we were not touring as much as we we've done for many years but there was a time where it was almost a 24 7 thing um yeah. you will be on your bike and you will wear a walkman <laughs> if you were walking around the street you would wear your walkman later on it became a discman if you were in your car, you turn off the radio and you put on a CD. If you came home, the, you, the first thing was not to get rid of your jacket, it was to go to the stereo and push play. And it's always been like that. I even when I was visiting friends and, and people, I have CDs in, in, in my pocket. And the first thing I said when I came in, can you put this on? <laughs> uh, and But that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Uh, I just think being so active and writing music and also you know uh, playing a lot of festivals you have music in in your ears constantly so when you have the opportunity to turn it off that's that, that's what i do yeah, so if i'm listening to music it's 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 in the morning when i when i'm running i, yeah. I, I run every morning but not even at that time i'm listening that much to to music i'm listening to a lot of podcasts or interviews or but there are certain bands when they come up with a, a new record and i'll be looking forward for that morning run and put on that new record so i'll say when i'm listening to music it, it, it's mostly in my car actually yep so when it comes to my children uh, they are aware of what daddy likes and some of the they find very interesting, very interesting, and other stuff they find very noisy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but right now, you know, I'm listening to a lot of different stuff. It's everything from Napalm Death to Baby Shark. Do, 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 do. <laughs> How good was the last Napalm record? So interesting. So many different ideas. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Yeah, it was yeah. awesome. Okay. So no, she's they have, you know, my girl, yeah. she's almost five years old. She ha already has her own favorite um uh bands you know and that's that's everything from you know britney spears <laughs> to uh to uh what is it there um there are certain songs from the new volpe record that she really likes uh and she remember the lyrics cool uh, so that there, there are some of uh there's some metal that 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 she likes but it's because then it, it has a uh, a beginning or a certain part in a song that that she remembers yeah and the boy is too young he's he's only like i don't know 11 months or something so uh you know yeah he doesn't know what's going on <laughs> <laughs> well um okay next question what who was the first artist you saw yourself in 
that you had like an affinity you felt like they were speaking from somewhere within you I guess uh, come again who was the first artist you saw yourself in that you felt like they were speaking how you yeah if that makes sense I, I know what you're saying but that, that's that's never how I looked at uh, really yeah yeah I, I know the performers that I love uh, and I like and I respect but I always I would say that I found a lot of inspiration but never saw myself in in any other artist than myself that's interesting yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what yeah I know that there was Presley came into some studio you know uh, he he was an electrician at that time and he was driving a, a truck and he was passing sun studio for you know every day in his lunch break just to look at the studio and, and he so much wanted to record uh, a birthday song for his mom yeah and uh, he he finally found the courage to actually walk up to the door and open it and i think he saved some money for for the work he's been doing as an electrician and he he was asking the secretary if he could record a song actually at that certain time you could just walk in from the street and and, and record a single i actually did that in some studio with one of my friends uh, really yeah What's um but, uh, it, it was just uh we we uh we wrote two songs together and it's only for us to hear so uh it is what it is you walked in the but, footsteps uh, of greats come again you walked in the footsteps of greats yeah, but yeah, and then Elvis, you know, he steps in and uh, and out of uh, curiosity, the secretary asked, uh, how do you sound like? And he just looked at her and said, I sound like nobody. Um, and it's not because I want to, I look at myself as, as, as that's that type of guy, but you know, I've never looked at anyone and said, that's me. I always find inspiration and then I've used time to figure out who I who I am and who I was. Yeah. What did um growing up uh in Denmark teach how do you think it was a unique experience? What um what were you guys exposed to? Like how did that kind of shape your perspective on the world, kind of coming from where you come from? I don't know if you know, I don't know anything else about growing up. Yeah, like, yeah. I suppose you haven't grown up anywhere else, so that makes sense. That's yeah. That how um how did you find your voice? What did you start? When did you start realizing that you had a voice? Like how how young and writing songs and all that stuff. And what was the catalyst for starting to do that? Um, I'm still learning. I'm, still, <laughs> I, you know, it's yeah, uh, and that that that's that's very honest. You know, I, I actually have to tell you something interesting about my voice. So let me come back to that if I forget it. Yep. Um, but uh, back in the days, I was um, playing death metal. Yes. And, um, so that was all about the growling. And, and um, that was all about finding that deep growling tone. And uh, that was great for those records and demos that we did. I'm still very much into death metal. Yeah, we don't. Um, but I had a friend and she said, why are you not singing? I said, why the fuck should I sing? I can't sing, you know, I'm good at growling. Yeah, you're pretty good at growling, but you can definitely sing. I said, I don't get it. You never heard me sing. I said, no, but I know that you have it in you. I, and I can still to this day, I still can't figure out how she knew, but she put it in my head somehow that well, maybe I can't sing. Um, but the thing was, um, I was, oh, she said, all the bands that you really, really like, they're great singers. Maybe, you know, you should try to pick up on that because I think you can do it. Um, so at the time where I, I um, put the, my death metal dominus to rest and wanted to uh, form um, a, a different band, where there, there was no specific style. I didn't want to have any rules or paint myself into a corner with all these rules. It was all about whatever we play, it's music, it's rock and roll. It, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, let's not put it into categories or anything. And I knew at that time I wanted to try to pick up that kind of thing called singing. But how, how and 
yeah, how do you start that? Where do you start? What is my voice? You know, how do yeah. I find that? So I knew the singers that I really liked, like Elvis Presley, and I liked um, singers like uh, uh, James Hetfield and and uh, Matt Barlow um, and, and James Dean Bradfield from Manic Street Preachers. That was that was some of the uh, the singers that I. Yeah, I really. There was a lot of singers that I like, you know, like <laughs> Ronnie James Dio. He he's the king, and Freddie Mercury and sure. Hank Diamond, and there's so many singers that I really, really like. But then, you know, the, the singers that I'm mentioning now, it was almost like I was trying to channel them a little bit. Yeah, and um, and I was so crazy about the voice that Matt Barlow has. You know, he, he's the former singer of uh, Ice Earth. Um, and, uh, I remember being on my, on my bicycle with my Walkman and we, I was just about to go to the studio with my death metal band Dominus at that time to record our second record. Yep. And, uh, I said, I'm, I'm going to see if I can figure this thing out called singing. And maybe I could sound a little bit like Matt Barlow maybe a little bit like hit feel here and there and see if I can channel them somehow. Yeah. And I was on my bike and I made sure I was driving at the countryside when nobody could hear me because I was screaming and yelling and trying to sing along to, to these songs. And I thought, wow, you know, that's sounds pretty, <laughs> sounds pretty decent until I stepped into the studio and it was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Fuck. is that me it sounds horrible oh, i can't do that i'll go back to growling you know, so <laughs> I, I got back One to moment. growling yeah. yeah wait a minute so um and then i think it was on the third dominus record i kind of started to have some tone and that was the early steps of trying to figure out how to sing but um uh, when i found volpe um it was just all about rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing. And I just got better and better and better. And the same thing for each Volbeat record. Uh, I, I developed a style. And I found, also found my way to cover up uh, different singers in the beginning. They could probably all tell stories how they're trying to cover up for their insecurity, for not thinking they sound right or, or whatsoever. I did that too. In the very beginning of some of the first Dominus records, uh, Vault Beat records, I, I cannot even do it now. It sounds like I have a potato in my mouth while I was singing. <laughs> but, you know, some people really loved that. <laughs> and it was like, why are you not singing like you did on the first record? I, I, I can't do it. You know, it's, I have to put five potatoes in my mouth and it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Um, Such a so, live instrument. Um, yeah, for each record, you know, I just developed and got better also because of the experience of touring and new inspiration. And uh, so some of the first Volbeat records, had, I had that really low tone, uh, deep tone. And we were also tuning in, in D. Uh, so there were, you know, for some reason, that was just how it was. And, yeah. and we were touring, start touring a lot, and I was blowing my voice on every tour, and it was so tough. At that time, we didn't have in ears, it was only monitors. And so many years after, I, I, I learned a great experience of, about um, that deep tone. And, you know, during the, the COVID, the, the, lo the lockdown, I uh, had a throat operation. Yeah, right. Uh, because uh, they found a very big uh, ugly polyp on the right side of my vocal chart. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it came to a point where I was talking like. Oh my God, that's so scary. How scary yeah. would it be for you? Oh I my God. I could, not, I could not sing. So I, yeah. I was in the rehearsal room and I was like, what is going on? Because I know how it feels to have the flu or, or stuff like I know how to work around that uh, and, and how it was sound. Um, but this was different. And yeah. I came home and I could barely speak. 
and, and my fiance said, you need to go to a doctor. This, this is, this is getting yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, they found this really huge um, polyp and I went through the operation and, um, and that it takes time to heal and, and, and cover up. And um, for four days, you're not allowed to say anything. And when you start talking again, you're only allowed to say a few words within an hour. Yep. And, and you work that up for months, a lot of months. So I, I went to the hospital like every, was it every once a month mm -hmm. where they have this camera and it's that something is uh, and now this is getting very interesting. This, we're not used to see to see this, but your vocal throat, if it's you know, the folds, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're saying, you know, they make vibration. That that's how it works. And they're supposed to touch each other. What's it? Yours. They're not touching. And that's very very weird. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, so when you use that low tone, that deep tone, you use a lot of air and strength, uh, strength to make your vocal cords touch each other. But when you're on high pitching, because on the last record, on this new record, and probably also the record before, I'm singing higher and higher, you know, um, I'm pitching higher. Totally. That's so much easier for me because my vocal charts are hitting each other. Wow. So, so every time I'm singing deep, I use so much air and I start talking like this. We said, we've never seen anything. It's probably been, been like that since the very beginning. Whoa. It, it doesn't seem, you're, now that your vocal charts has been healing on that side with the polypus, it's still not touching. It's touching when you're high pitching. Yeah. So, and so they said, it seems also like the last couple of records you did, because they were listening to my records to figure out my tone, that you sound more natural when you're high pitching. And some of the fans are saying, oh no, he's pitching too high. Where's the low tone? Where's the deep tone? Uh, it's still there, but it's, it's just more tough for me to tour with a lot of songs that has the deep tone because I'll have to use a lot of strength, a lot of air to make my uh, vocal charts touch each other. So wow. That, but yeah, it's quite interesting. So that's a lot of the new songs where, you know, we tuned in E and I'm pitching higher to actually be able to sing. Yeah. And not, and not ruin my, my vocal charts. Wow. But my whole thing is now to keep on training, finding a technique also to bring the deep tone back into the vocal beat songs on coming records. Yeah. So I so so it becomes a natural thing. Um, so right now, you know, I'm I think I'm still learning and trying to figure the whole thing out. So um, and. Uh, I know I'm, I'm very much aware that I have a, a unique voice. People love it or they hate it. <laughs> and and when, 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 when you have a voice where people love it and hate it, you know you got something special. Definitely. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm very satisfied um, where I'm at, but this is not the only thing that I'm struggling with. Yeah. On top of that, I actually have... Um, uh, throat hernia whoa so it means that i don't have that uh thing that blocks when uh, uh brit do you actually know you, you, you're aware of uh, the thing i said i got the throat hernia mm -hmm. what, what was the right word for that a nodule i, I don't know is it i think it's a nodule yeah it's it when you don't have that thing that locks down Oh, when, trachea? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But, I don't know. But yeah, even when I'm sleeping, I, I, I'm, I have to lay very high with my, my head because all the acid that you have in your stomach, yeah. mine can go up and down the whole night. I don't have that thing. All your other people have that blocks it. Holy so, 
So if that keeps on doing this, doing it, I don't be talking like this the day after. So I, bad vibe for sure. Bad vibe for so, sure. So I shouldn't pointed. actually be a singer. I should just I come say. up and play the guitar. It's, and there will yeah. probably be people out there saying, yeah, you should do that because you sound so fucking irritating. Just play that guitar. I think there'd be and a lot of people. Other people would say, no, they'd don't be sad. Do that. I think that's, there'd be a lot of sadness. Let's be real. It's, um, yeah, you. That's that's an incredible. You have a lot of physical challenges with such a physical instrument. It's such a physical yeah, instrument. It's such you know, a reflection. Okay, how did you fall in love what's with heavy life metal? Without a little pain. Exactly. How did you yeah. fall in love with heavy metal when you were a kid? So, because I know you've been like listening to Entombed since you're like 15, Left Hand Path. Like you're a, you know, you had a death metal band for ages. How did you find? How did this rock and roll loving kid find heavy metal? Uh, I, I was very very young. Um, my um, my mom's brother was living next uh, next to the house uh, where my parents and, and me and my sisters were living. So uh, a lot of times, you know, we would go into his house and listen to vinyls. You know, he had so many great records and he had so much different kind of music. And we were just small kids, you know, still at that time where it was fun to jump on the bed while you were listening to music. Uh, and uh, we just kept on visiting him and then going into his room where all his records were and listening to music and dancing to music. Uh, until one day I, I pulled out the record and I was like, Ooh, what is this? It's kind of scary. It was this woman on the graveyard. And, it was, and he said, oh, that's Black Sabbath. You're way too young for that. You know? <laughs> and you, you can't tell a kid. <laughs> No way. You put this on. No, 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 no. You'll never understand. You know, it's it's not for you. You know, we'll wait for that. All right. So the first thing I did when he left the house, because I knew where his key was, you know, was to lock myself in and pick up that Black Sabbath record. Down, down, down. I need that. <laughs> you know. So Black Sabbath was the thing, um, and uh, I don't know if I just heard the A side or uh, I don't remember, but I heard a good bunch of songs and put it back. And a couple of days after when I went in there, I said, can we listen to some music again? And he said, yeah. And he said, um, how is that Black Sabbath record? I said, I haven't touched it. He said, don't lie. I can see if anyone have touched my records. And I knew it was you. Yeah, okay. I, I, I really liked it. I, I actually love it. I, and he took it, you know what? I said, this is yours. Don't tell your mom and dad that I gave it to you. Don't play it backwards because Satan will haunt you. And I was like, really? Oh my God, that sounds fantastic. See you later. Uh, I jumped over the fence. And of course, the first thing I did when I came to was like, and I, I, you know, and Satan spoke uh, to you, <laughs> and you were on the left hand path. <laughs> but so I was, you know, I, I would say I've probably been listening to heavy metal since, you know, I probably start listening to it since I was 10 years old. Or so. Awesome. Yeah. Did you dress like a metalhead? When you, like, yeah, you later, later, on, yeah. I did, later yeah. on, I definitely did. Um, uh, you know, I think I speak for everybody when uh, guys try to grow long hair that suddenly you have very long hair here, but the neck is still. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was all about uh, try to get that long hair and, you know, wear black and all the band uh, shirts. And, you know, I love those days with you know, there's no Internet, you know, yeah. uh, it was all about finding the music magazines and when suddenly you know the music magazines you could get in stores was you know uh, the mainstream stores was not enough it was all about finding the underground magazines in in, in independent record uh, shops and that, that was such a uh, adventure um i really missed those day those days there was a lot of times i didn't went to school i just took the train from the small countryside i lived to go to Copenhagen, the, uh, 
on the main city in, 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 uh, in Denmark. And there was a lot of record stores at that time. So I could use a whole day just, you know, uh, shopping records for the money I saved up. And, um, and the whole trip home in the train, looking at covers and lyrics and, and you know, even coming home with uh, demo tapes. Uh, I also really miss tape trading. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, yeah. yeah we when, involved I, when, in I started, when I started Dominus, you know, I was tape trading with a lot of uh, death metal bands. Uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, I really, I really miss those days. You know, the hunt uh, for the magical record, and um, and that hunt is not there anymore. The magic is kind of gone. Yeah. But uh, figuring out what record you wanted to listen to when you came to the record store, because you bought you bought this underground magazine, and you you could read a little bit about this uh, scary band, whoever it was, and. And then you could jump on the train and then one hour, one hour and a half later, you would be in that record store. So I need to listen to that record. And um, I, I, I just loved that. And then, you know, tape, tape trading and bringing my own demos. And um, uh, now what was the question? That <laughs> talking i think mean, we're just talking about metal um <clears throat> do you remember the first really positive response you got from sending the dominus tape like because people wrote handwritten letters right did they write letters or did they just send the tape yeah, you know, it, it, it was all handwritten letters and uh we put flyers in it you know to promote our demo or our coming show uh and uh so you were trading flyers and so you took other bands flyers and brought them to um to shows or record stores and just put them on the table that was how to promote yourself at that time you know yeah. i i remember using days just walking around different cities put my own flyers on on every table in the record stores that i knew jump into a train go to the next city and then visit the record stores put your flyers on the table or you would just send a good bunch in in, in an envelope and then hope that the record store would put them out but the best thing was to do it by yourself because then you knew they were in the store yeah um what a different so, world yeah you know but honestly i still miss it because it 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 was so special and i think i'm not really an internet dude and i'm yeah. totally not into totally not into social medias. I'm totally not into how to promote things today. Uh, I think it's it's not really interesting. The soul is not there. The spirit flies out of the window. Everything is just one bottom away. And the next second, you're... Yes. You know, it's not interesting for me. So that's the part I'm not going to miss when, when I decide to retire. You know, yeah, um, don't do that. I'm totally yeah. not into how to promote uh, yeah. my music uh, the way it is done today. So it's the old school, the old school thing is something that I really miss. You know, that tape tra tape trading thing, and and you know, going into the different record stores, finding those records that you've been reading about in the underground magazine, or just finding bands that you never heard of, and and put it on the desk, and then the guy at the shop would play it on the vinyl uh, yeah. record player. And the thing was, not much music was released at that time. Yeah. Today, there's been a million bands releasing music every it's exhausting. day. It's exhausting. Can't, yeah, it, it's almost too much. Yeah, it is too much. Um, but you know, the new generation—that's how it works for them. So good for them. More power to them. But an old geese like me, you know, I'm just you know not into it. <laughs> well, we've talked about the king. What about King Diamond? What was your um, first experience of King Diamond? The other King. King Diamond? Yeah, the other King. Yeah. So you got I Elvis, think? you got King Diamond. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, King Diamond was a huge and still is a, a huge inspiration for me and will always be. And I'm uh, very proud and humble of saying this that he's one of my very good friends uh, uh, these days uh such a good guy and um uh, you can learn a lot talking with king diamond you know he has 
a lot of experience. He, he's been there some years before me, but he's also still very, very, very old school. But at the same time, you know, he's actually uh, keeping up with a lot of the, the new ways of, of promoting yourself. I have so much respect for Kim Dyer. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, the first time I get into King Diamond, you know, I, I'm, I'm very young, very young. Um, I remember being at a record store in the city I lived and um, going through the, the heavy metal vinyls. And suddenly there's this guy, you know, with cops painting, but there's also this reindeer. And this is no present for Christmas. Like, what the fuck? What is this? <laughs> what is this? And uh, I put it on. I was blown away. And I was like, oh my God, this is great. And a very few days after, you know, the Danish newspaper brought up two pages with King Diamond coming to Denmark. Wow. And I think. And I think um, at that time he released uh, them, the, the the King Diamond album them, and uh, I, I was just hypnotized, spellbound, and uh, um, and I was reading that he was Danish, and then it was like I didn't I didn't know that at that time Whoa. that it was that he was uh, a Danish guy just like me and. Um, but he lived uh, in America, in, in, in Dallas, Texas. Um, so that was very, very, and I started getting to, to, to King Diamond and, and buying the records. And, and uh, of course, very quickly found out that he had a band before King Diamond. So it was like, <gasps> merciful fate. Oh, here we go again. Just what I need. Yeah. King Diamond and some more Satan stuff. Yeah, here we go. I need it. <laughs> <More Yeah. safe. laughs> you know, so um, uh, that was just again stepping into a bubble of pure joy and excitement. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when I formed my own band, Dominus, uh, that was definitely also a lot of merciful fake King Diamond inspiration in that. Sure. And also from the very beginning of Volpe, that's been King Diamond inspiration. And, and as people probably know, we, we have King Diamond on our Outlaw Gentleman record on the song Room 24. Yeah. But just to get back to how with King Diamond, I remember the first King Diamond show I was supposed to attend and um, I didn't have them. I was saying to my father, you know, listen, uh, I'm reading that King Diamond comes to Copenhagen. I got to go. And uh, I said, yeah, but, you know, that concert ticket, uh, concert tickets is very expensive. And you're going to need merchandise, train ticket, you need something to drink, you need something to eat. How are you going to find all those money? You, you're just in school and say, uh, I don't know. And he said, I, I, you know, I'm going to give you half of it. And you have to figure out how to get the second half. All right. So I went out in the garage and I took my beloved bike. And that, that was the bike. And you, you remember the, the movie E.T., those kind of bikes? You follow me? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I had that bike and it was my, 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 my pressure. Yeah. But that was the only thing I had that had any value. So I went up to, to the guy we actually bought the bike from and said, how much? I, said, oh, I don't even remember how much he gave me. I said, there you go. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to King Diamond and come and yeah. You sold your bike for a King Diamond ticket. That's yeah, so I came home. That's amazing. And, my father, and I said, you know, uh, by the way, I'm leaving this weekend. What? What, what, what are you doing? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I'm going to King Diamond and come Hagen. Where do you got the money? Sold my bike. You sold your bike. <laughs> but, you know, later on, he thought that was very smart because while I was at the King Diamond show, he had to go out and buy my uh, buy me a new bike so I could get to school on Monday. 
you know. <laughs> so, yeah. This is very strategic. Smart move. Smart move. Very was it, smart. Was it amazing? Was it, it was amazing. It yeah. was amazing. Amazing, amazing. And I, I became the biggest King Diamond fan after that. And um, so, but that, of course, that was not enough. I needed a King Diamond tattoo. And uh, I remember calling the tattoo artist in, in the small city I, I lived in. And I said, Yen, that was the, uh, the guy. Um, I, I need this tattoo. He said, Michael. You're not old enough. I, I, I can't do it. I'm not allowed to. I said, yeah, but I finally found the one that I, that I really want. You know, he, he was used to be me coming up to his store because I was hanging out with a lot of guys that was older than me and who, who had a lot of tattoos. And I was just watching them getting tattoos and I was still not old enough. And, and he, he said, you know what? You, you can always come up here when you're old enough. And I, and I make your tattoo see it but i need this, this merciful fate with king diamond I need, you have to understand i can't live without it and uh, he was just so sick and tired listening to me he said you know you know what you if you come now i'll do it but you keep your mouth shut you know because i'm not allowed to do it so i can't do it today because i'm having my exam or it's at school and, and he said, I don't give a fuck. And I said, yeah, me too. I'm on my way. You saw, you saw <laughs> yeah. like, I missed exams for King Diamond. Yeah, I didn't got my exam, but I got merciful fate on my leg. <laughs> don't break the oath. There you go. <laughs> I love that so much. It's, well, you said he taught you a lot. What did he, what's the biggest thing he taught you? Well, no, you know, the, the thing is, uh, later on when uh, King Diamond then came back to Copenhagen and was playing shows, I was still uh, in uh, Dominus at that time. I don't know if we released the first or second album. And um, I had a friend in a record store in Copenhagen and the owner was a guy called uh, Ken Anthony. Um, some people might know him because he was the first guy who really took care of Metallica back in the days when they were visiting uh, uh, Denmark so he helped them up with he helped them up with with some stuff and he was also helping King with with some stuff but he was a good friend with King Diamond he said you know what uh, you're probably aware of that King Diamond's gonna play in in Copenhagen say yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going yeah but you know he's he's visiting he's gonna be here in the record store um uh tomorrow I'm gonna close down the store because uh uh, so he can just walk around and uh, nice. And but you, if you be here at I don't know what time it was, dude, I introduce you to him because you and him, you know, you're so similar. You you remind me so much of King Diamond. You know, his his eager and his uh, his dedication to his craft and and being interested in all this uh, Satanism and and all this stuff you got to meet him and I'll do you that favor. So I didn't sleep all night. It was, oh my, oh my God, I'm going to be King Diamond. Oh my God, I'm going to be King Diamond. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so I, you know, I showed up at the store and, um, and he said, yeah, you know, he's down there looking at records. Just go down and talk to him. So, and I, at that time I had, you know, it was weird seeing King Diamond without his makeup. You know? Yeah. But you know, you got to give it to the, the mighty King Domino. He's so down to earth. I, it only took a few minutes and then it just felt like talking to one of your good friends. You know, he he's so cool. And so yeah. we, we were talking a lot about music, of course, a lot about King Diamond music, but also he was very interesting in what I was doing. And then um, so I was talking about Dominus and some how I was inspired by his lyrics and concept. At that time, I just did my first concept album with Dominus called The First Nine. So he thought that was very interesting. And of course, he took it as a compliment. <clears throat> um, so he also told me a lot about his first visit uh, where he was visiting uh, Anton Chantal of Faye. Uh, wow. We had, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had a really good talk. and. And I think later on, I uh, hooked up with him again in the same record store. And, and then, 
you know, by the time, you know, uh, I got to know Hank Sherman and Michael Denner. And Michael Denner, I got to know because he also had a record store in Copenhagen. So I'll be talking to him and I'll be meet Sometimes Hank Sherman was hanging out at the same bar I, I was uh, hanging out. And so we start talking and, um, and um, when Volbeat start touring America, King Diamond will show up when we were playing Texas uh, because, because he also uh, used some of our crew guys. You're right. So, so uh, I've been seeing King Diamond a lot. And then when he was in, in Denmark visiting family, you know, he would come to my house and we would hang out. And his, his wife is, is, is great. And um, those are really good people. And uh, so, I, and a lot of times I'll be on the phone with King just talking for hours about, it's not only about music anymore, it's basically yeah. just about life, life you know? Uh, and that's what I really like, you know, he's also a father now. Yeah. And, um, and so, but you know, that's always great stuff to learn about people who's been in the scene longer than you or just life. even have, you know, that's my hope on more yeah. life experience. Um, so my hat off to King Diamond, lots of respect and love, um, still a huge fan. So. You got two kings. So you've had two significant Kings in your life. So King, the King Elvis versus King Diamond, who would you <laughs> choose? These are important. No, I, I, I never done anything like that. I don't put people. You're not going to pick. No, I don't. They put share people a lot though. People. They share a lot of, so they give a lot of themselves yeah, to the music. You know, yeah. They all That's number one. Question. Okay. Question for you. Um, now, like everyone, everyone has been affected by Metallica. Every metal band's been affected by Metallica on some level. You guys have, you know, been championed by them. You know, you would have been a fan. They're clearly a fan of you. And I understand it. Like you've got, I think one of the great things about Volbeat is how huge everything is. You know, it's like big riffs, big sound, you know, it's, it shares something. Um, everything's so defined and distinct sort of thing. I, I wanted to know how did, how has that relationship sort of progressed and what was it like kind of discovering that a band like that and Hetfield and stuff were a fan of yours and how that's kind of, yeah. Yeah, of course, very early on, I discovered uh, Metallica, um, but it was not, you know, I, I remember that the record that really turned me into a Metallica fan was And Justice for All. Interesting. Uh, uh, and I did at that time had um, both um, uh, Master of Puppets, Ride the Lightning, and Kill 'Em All on, on cassette, cassette tapes. I was listening, and I was listening to that. Uh, I'm sorry, Metallica. I was, uh, you know, recording it. You know, a friend recorded it to me, but I bought the record later. You know that I bought the record later. <laughs> you pirated. That's like some <laughs> that pirated. Yeah. So. Um, uh, but actually, it was the and Justice for All album that really turned me into a Metallica fan, uh, and uh, I've been a fan ever since. And uh, I remember we got a phone call. Uh, what was it? I, don't, I think it was in two thousand and eight. I think maybe earlier seven. Oh. That Metallica was coming to Denmark. And they hadn't, at that time, they hadn't been in Denmark for a very, very long time. Wow. And uh, they wanted to have some Danish support for the show. So um, I think it was Lars maybe looking at MySpace at that time, checking out <laughs> what was going on. Uh, I knew that he was calling different people in Denmark. He, he knows so many people and he was asking, so what's going on in Denmark? What was the big buzz? Yeah. Uh, and everybody was talking about Volbeat. At that time, we, I think we, yeah, we released our second album. It's a big one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so maybe it was actually, if the, uh, well, yeah, they, yeah, we released our second album. And um, everybody was talking about Volbeat and say, all right, I'm going to check it out. And I actually think he checked it out on MySpace. That, that's how I remember it. And when we got a, a phone call um, from um, 
Live Nation, uh, uh, a guy called Christian Kral, which is uh, a, a guy that I know is one of my friends. And he said, you want to open up for Metallica? It was pretty much the first word he said, fuck you. Well, why are you calling me? You know, you, you want to go out and drink beers? Because that's, that's what we did, you know. And me and him and and and, and one of my other friends, uh, Lasse, and then I said, no, 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 I'm asking if you want to see it. Come on, be, be serious. You know, don't joke around. You know, what is it? I said, no, I'm, I'm serious. You know, they, they want you to open up for them when they come back to them. Oh my God. You know, so, uh, oh, yeah, you know, we'll be ready. We'll, we'll be ready. So um, we had that show. And it, it went very, very, very good. And um, James was the first one coming over to our dressing room and just uh, chit-chatting, hanging out and being very curious about the band. And uh, yeah, you know, I remember he said something like, uh, yeah, I heard you guys play some kind of Elvis metal. I think I like it. <laughs> and uh that that, was that'll basically, stick with you <laughs> that'll stick with that you was, yeah so that was basically the start of a kind of a relationship between uh metallica and Volbeat. and uh i think we we managed to impress them that that day because they uh yeah, they kept on calling us yeah, you know? I was so say. they must have done something right yeah and, uh, so they've been very kind to invite Volbeat to join them a lot of times in, yeah. in America, but also a few times in Europe, as I remember or recall. Um, so yeah, that, that turned into a great relationship. You know, got yeah. to know James a, a little bit better, and uh, and also Lars. And I uh, can only say tons of respect and love. Uh, amazing guys, amazing human beings, and again. Uh, a lot, a, a lot to learn, you know. Being tour with with uh, such, such uh, experienced people, um, yeah. yeah. So lots of respect and love. Consummate and performance. You both are, yeah. It's huge. It's huge sounding. Let's let's both bands are huge sounding, and that's what's great about them. That's but yeah, yeah. But, but you know, getting back to the music, it's yeah. been very obvious that uh, a, a band like Metallica <clears throat> has been a huge inspiration and impact on Volby. You know that. I always managed to uh, pick up some great inspirations from Metallica. It, it's there. We're proud of it. And I think we, you know, uh, at the same time, managed to create our own unique styles. Uh, yes. But um, we're not afraid of telling people who we like. Uh, and, uh, Metallica definitely one of them. Well, it's everything's a rock and roll family tree. Like no one, no one exists without the thing before it. Like, the, and that's what the great been the great thing about this show. Everyone yeah, has yeah. got all of this yeah, stuff yeah. woven exactly. through them. What what matters is how you take it and then make it your own. And it's you know it's it's wonderful to see. Like, okay, your musical Mount Rushmore. If we had four faces carved in the stone, I might know the answers to this. But from our conversation, you could deduce. But who would you have carved into the stone? if you had four faces for what reason um just to celebrate them <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i set that up very well <laughs> my mom my daughter my son and my fiance that is the coolest answer of all of them that is the coolest answer of no one has ever shouted out their loved ones i think that's about us <laughs> um five songs that change your life oh wow only five songs. Ah, that it's a tough one. But I'll, I'll, def I'll definitely say the opening song on the first Black Sabbath record because I was paralyzed. <laughs> and um, I'll, um, It's a hard question. I drop it on. Yeah, uh, it, uh, definitely Elvis Presley, but uh, to pick a certain song, uh, let's you know, let's just pick one. But because there is the guy recorded seven hundred songs, so there's a good bunch. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, but a song like "Let's Play House." Did something to me, you know, the, the kind of rhythm, the way he plays around with his vocals. Uh, a third one, what could that be? Um, uh, 
probably say spirits are healing with death. No, oh, we haven't even talked about Chuck. I think Chuck is the Elvis of death metal. I oh, think he really is. He's the total that's, Elvis. He's got all the, the third. That's the third king. Yeah, he, he like so that was the band. I watched that live in LA. You know that live in LA, Death Raw, Raw, whatever. I saw that on YouTube when I was younger, and I was like, oh, death metal can be this interesting. It was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, fuck, like he does all this stuff with like his voice and it's so different. There's so much emotion and color. And yeah, what, let, let's talk about, how, what are your feelings on Chuck? Let's, let's talk about death for a minute. As I said, that's the third yeah. king. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are king conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the three kings. Uh, you know, I, I think we can all agree all, on that he is the creator of, death metal i know that people are also talking about persist but persist did have more fresh influences that death ever had death was definitely pure death metal and i also think that chuck took that rowling thing a step further from just roaring or screaming you know he 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 did that deep growling thing so you know i'll definitely say that he is the inventor creator and the king of death metal um all hell i don't know all, all what all hell all hell, hell? yeah all hell. <laughs> like, all hell yeah <laughs> um yeah yeah um but that you know he and i still think those death records are the best death metal records of all time uh, spiritual healing being my absolute favorite number one death metal album of all time wow. and autopsy will be my second favorite death metal band of all time uh, <clears throat> but yeah you know uh the, his guitar tone amazing amazing uh his his growling tone the best but his you know his his talent of writing really good death metal you know i never heard anyone uh, come close to that. You know, there's a lot of extreme talented death metal guitar players and songwriters out there. But for me, Chuck is the king and the throne cannot be touched. And, um, and you know, I also think he, he brought something different into uh, the metal scene. Uh, of course, with uh, Scream Bloody Gore and, and Leprosy, it was more about the horror stuff in the lyrics and maybe some satanic stuff just for the image of it. Um, later on, he, he became more, you can say, relevant about his subjects. And that was something you could uh, see on the Spiritual Healing album. So suddenly, he put a lot of question mark to you know, the whole American system, society, um, how things works in America are basically just also religion. Yeah. And uh, which also explains a lot about the cover artwork. So suddenly there was a guy who actually had something on his mind, not only about blood, horror, splat and and all that, you know, that's, that's a lot of fun too. Yeah. But uh, it, you, you never really, heard anything like it so it was like okay what is this try and what was this guy trying to tell us okay. so and uh he was clever you know he had a good mind he had a good mindset and that was definitely a lesson to learn in all that hmm. so i think the combination of really bringing subjects up like that and and have that sound it just turned the music even more evil somehow it's like he's actually talking about real stuff here and it works so there was definitely a lot of inspiration uh, getting from uh, a band like Death and, and Chuck. So, um, and, uh, I, you know, I know for sure that I will get a Chuck tattoo one day. You know, it's, I just have to find the right time. Get a giant back piece of um, Chuck when he was young. Uh, just here. Yeah, just. <laughs> <laughs> so Death. You know, it's uh, a strong I, I, ass move. You're just like, yeah. yep, I'm wearing yeah. my heart. No, you should get the three kings. You should get Elvis, King Diamond, and Chuck uh, in, in like a biblical, like a religious, maybe like a religious thing, maybe with some stained glass, <laughs> like make it make it a bit biblical. That'd be that'd be an experience. Okay, you got two more songs, and then we, you know. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my god. Uh, see, oh, I god. remember. I can. I will take. <laughs> I'll let the tangent go. I was hoping that you forgot. I'd pull this out. I know. Yeah. 
Nice try. Yeah. Nice try, buddy. Uh, um, um, I mean, that was a really good answer. So, you know, yeah, you can be brief on these ones. <laughs> <laughs> that was really... um, but you know, life changing. It, it's yeah. it's a big word. It's a big yes. word. Uh, maybe last in line with Dio. But you, def- did you see Dio? Did you see Dio play? Did you oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course you did. Yeah, yeah. I only saw him once. He's like this big yeah. and so huge. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Big heart. Yeah. Um, that definitely did something to me, without any doubt. Um, I know a lot of people yeah. are praising uh, the um, the Holy Diver album. I love it too. It's an amazing classic album, but uh, there's something about the last line how it, it, it affected me and that song. So, um, all right, so I got one more left. One more. Uh, what could that be? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just go a little bit further in time. So I'll say down here with the rest of us with social distortion. Dude, my not goodness. only, yeah, not only is it a great song, but I so much dig the lyrics. It, it's he's so spot on, you know, and uh, you and him share a lot. That rock, you know, that obviously rockability, like the ability to take that into this kind of quite modern style of yeah. music and make it your own. Like there's there's a lot of parallels with him, I think. Like not, not like direct, but like, you know what I mean. I, I actually do have social yeah. distortion to two. Of my album, but it's not only because of the band, but because yeah. that's only how you can feel being a youngster and trying to fit. You know, yes. You can feel social distorted. Yeah. It's a concept. Yeah. yeah. Well, Thank you. It's been, really, it's been really interesting. Like I love doing this. It's so much fun because every yeah, like all artists were fans first, and that's why the cold <laughs> show is called Fan First. So you know, all right, it's, it's all nice right. fun. Well, yeah, thank you. Wait, are you are you writing new music now? Servant yeah. of the Mind was sick. Are you writing new music yet, or Servant of the Mind was awesome? The same. Yeah, yeah. Servant of the Mind is our new, our new record. It's and, amazing. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. And we are playing six songs on this tour from the album. Of course, we want to play all the new songs, but uh, you know, we got some old good songs as well. So it's sure kind of mixed up a little bit. But yeah, I have tons of ideas for new songs. So uh, uh can't wait to start working on that again. I don't know when that's gonna be. We have a quite busy year now touring if Mother Nature would let us. So um <laughs> let's see. May the dark forces be with you. May may live touring continue. Thank you very Thank much you so for much. joining us, everyone. This is Michael Paulson of Volbeat. This is the Revolver Fan First podcast. Good day to you. <laughs>